what I want to do in this video is kind of introduce you to the idea of one, how carbon-14 uh, comes about and how it gets into all living things. And then in, in either later this video or in future videos, we'll talk about how it's actually used to date things, how we, we use it to actually figure out that that bone is 12,000 years old, that that person died 18,000 years ago, whatever it might be. So let me draw the Earth. So let me just draw the surface of the Earth like that. That's just a little section of the surface of the Earth. And then we have the atmosphere of the Earth. I'll draw that in yellow. So then you have the Earth's atmosphere right over here. Let me write that down. Atmosphere. Atmosphere. And 78%, the most abundant, the most abundant element in our atmosphere is nitrogen. It is 78% nitrogen and I'll write nitrogen its its symbol is just n and it has 7 protons and it also has 7 neutrons so it has an atomic mass of roughly 14 then this is the most typical isotope of nitrogen and we talk about the word isotope in the chemistry playlist an isotope the t the protons define what element it is but this number up here can change depending on the number of neutrons you have. So the different versions of a given element, those are each called isotopes. I just view them in my head as versions of an element. So anyway, we have our atmosphere. And then coming from our sun, we have what's commonly called cosmic rays. But they're actually not rays. They're cosmic particles. They're mainly, you could view them as just single protons, which is the same thing as a hydrogen nucleus. They can also be alpha particles, which is the same thing as a helium nucleus. And there's even a few electrons. And they're going to come in, and they're going to bump into things in our atmosphere, and they're actually going to form neutrons. So they're actually going to form neutrons. And we'll show a neutron with a lowercase n and a 1 for its mass number. And, and we don't write anything, because it has no protons down here. Like we had for nitrogen, we had 7 protons. So it's not really an element. It is a subatomic particle. But you have these neutrons form. And every now and then, and I'm not, you know, let's just be clear, this isn't like a typical reaction, but every now and then, one of those neutrons will bump into one of the nitrogen 14s in just the right way, into one of the nitrogen 14s in just the right way, so that it, it bumps off one of the protons in the nitrogen. So it bumps off one of the protons in the nitrogen and re essentially replaces that proton with itself. So let me make it clear. So it bumps off one of the protons. So instead of seven protons, we now have six protons. But it's, this number 14 doesn't go down to 13 because it replaces it with itself. So this still stays at 14. And now since it, only has, since it now only has six protons, this is no longer nitrogen. By definition, this is now carbon. And that proton that was bumped off just kind of gets emitted. So then let me just do that another color. So plus, and a proton that's just flying around, you could call that hydrogen hydrogen 1. And it can gain an electron some ways. If it doesn't gain an electron, it's just a, it's just a hydrogen ion, a positive ion, either way, or a hydrogen nucleus. But this process, and once again, it's not a typical process, but it happens every now and then. This is how carbon-14 forms. So this right here is carbon-14. You can essentially view it as a nitrogen 14, where one of the protons is replaced with a neutron. And what's interesting about this is this is constantly being formed in our atmosphere. It's not in huge quantities, but in, in reasonable quantities. So let me write this down. Constantly being formed. Constant, constant formation. And what happens is, and, and let's, let me be very clear. Let's look at the periodic table over here. Typical carbon, so carbon, by definition, if you have six protons, Carbon, by definition, it has six protons. But the typical isotope, the most common isotope of carbon, is carbon-12. So carbon-12, carbon-12 is the most common. Is the most common. So most of the carbon in your body is carbon-12. But what's interesting is, is that a small fraction of carbon-14 forms, and then this carbon-14 can then also combine with oxygen to form carbon dioxide. And then that carbon dioxide gets absorbed into the rest of the atmosphere, into our oceans. It can be fixed by plants. When people talk about carbon fixation, they're really talking about using mainly light energy from the sun to take gaseous carbon and turn it into actual kind of organic tissue. And so this carbon-14, this carbon-14 makes its way, makes its way. It's constantly being formed. It makes its way into oceans, 
oceans. It's already in the air, but it completely mixes through the whole atmosphere. Oceans and the air. And then it makes its way into plants. And then it makes a way, and the plants are really just, they're really just made out of that fixed carbon, that carbon that was taken in gaseous form and put into, put into uh, I guess you could say, into kind of a solid form, put it into a living form. That's what wood pretty much is. It, puts it, it gets put into plants, and then it gets put into the things that, the, that eat the plants. So that could be, that could be us. Now why is, this, why is this even interesting? I've just explained a mechanism where some of our body, even though carbon-12 is the most common isotope, some of our body, while we're living, gets made up of this carbon-14 thing. Well, the interesting thing is the only time you can take in this carbon-14 is while you're alive, while you're eating new things. Because as soon as you die and you get buried under the ground, there's no way for the carbon-14 to become part of your tissue anymore, because it's not being, uh, you're not eating anything with new carbon-14. And what's interesting here is once you die, you're not going to get any new carbon-14. And that carbon-14 that you did have at your death is going to so the carbon-14 that you did have is going to decay, is going to decay via beta decay, and we learned about this, back into, back into nitrogen-14. So the kind of this process reverses. So it'll decay back into nitrogen-14, and beta decay, you emit an electron and an electron antineutrino. I won't go into the details of that. But essentially what you have happening here is you have one of the neutrons is turning into a proton and emitting and emitting this stuff in the process. Now why is this interesting? So I just said while you're living, you have kind of straight up carbon-14. As soon as, and carbon-14 is constantly doing this decay thing. But what's interesting is as soon as you die and, and, and you're not ingesting any more plants or, any, or breathing from the atmosphere if you are a plant or fixing from the atmosphere, and this even applies to plants, once a plant dies, it's no longer taking in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and turning it into new tissue. The carbon-14 in that tissue gets frozen. And this carbon-14 does this decay over at a, at a specific rate at a specific rate. And then you can use that rate to actually determine how long ago that thing must have died. So the rate, the rate at which this happens, so the rate of carbon-14 decay is essentially half disappears, half gone, half gone in roughly 5,730, 5,730 years. And this is actually called a half-life. And we talk about it in other videos. This is called a half-life. And I want to be clear here. You don't know which half of it's gone. It's a probabilistic thing. You can't just say, oh, all of the carbon-14s on the left are going to decay, and all the carbon-14s on the right aren't going to decay in that 5,730 years. What it's essentially saying is any given carbon-14 atom has a 50% chance of decaying into nitrogen-14 in 5,730 years. So over the course of 5,730 years, roughly half of them will have decayed. Now why is that, why is that interesting? Well, if you know that all living things have a certain proportion of carbon-14 in their, in, their, in their tissue as kind of part of what makes them up, and then if you were to find some bone, let's just say find some bone right here. That you, know, you dig it up on some type of archaeology dig, and you say, hey, that bone has one half the carbon-14, one half the carbon-14 of of all the living things that you see right now. So you could, it would be a pretty reasonable uh, estimate to say, well, that thing must be 5,730 years old. Even better, maybe you you dig a little deeper and you find another bone. Maybe you find another bone, maybe a couple of feet even deeper. And you say, wow, you know, this thing right over here has one fourth the carbon 14. This has one fourth the carbon 14 that I would expect to find in something living. So, how old is this? Well, if it only has one fourth the carbon 14, it must have gone through two half lives. After one half life, it would have had, uh, it would have one half the carbon. And then after another half life, half of that also turns into uh, uh, nitrogen 14. And so this would involve two half lives. Two half lives, which is the same thing as two times five thousand and seven hundred thirty years, or you would say that this thing is this thing is what this thing is ten thousand. You would say this thing is eleven thousand four hundred 
and sixty years old, give or take.